we're going to be talking about material theming, building, an ex building expressively with material components. Oh, and I have the clicker. <laughs> and I'm Yasmin Evian. I'm a design advocate at Google. And I'm Michelle Alvarez. I'm a designer on the material design team at Google. And in 2014, we introduced material design as a system for creating beautiful, bold, and consistent digital products. And with the system came principles and guidelines. We use paper as a metaphor, something that everyone is pretty familiar with. Paper is something you interact with usually on a daily basis. It moves when you touch it, as well as casting shadows. And we kind of wanted to build upon this reality that was grounded that you would understand. And we use color surfaces and typography to create emphasis, to really give clear signals to the user of what they could do in a product. And with that, we had some style decisions. We used Roboto, which provided a great uh, sans serif for Android to really build great user experiences that were easy to scan. And we also provided some color palette options that really allowed uh, really good pairings that looked great in your UI. And with the Roboto type scale and all the surfaces and uh, shape and our guidance around that and our fixed color palettes, we really created this unified design system, which really unified all apps across Google, whether it was on mobile, uh, the web, or desktop, as well as uh, Android. And beyond unifying all the apps at Google, we also unified millions of external apps that had launched using material design on Android, iOS, and the web. And the consistency was great for usability. It allowed users to easily navigate an app across platforms, and it was just really easy to use. You looked at it, you could recognize it, and you knew what you were doing. But it also left little room for expression. Uh, in this example, we have our Gmail app, which is a Google product, and on the other side is a competitor email client, and they look pretty similar, right? Besides changing the color, it looked pretty, uh, pretty much the same. So we asked ourselves, how might we allow for brand expression while maintaining the usability of material design? And that's when last year we announced material theming. It provided more flexibility, excuse me, it provided more flexibility for brands to express their different styles. So in order to create material theming, we needed a playground for these ideas. <clears throat> we knew that third parties were coming from all different content types and contexts, and we wanted to be able to su support their needs. So what we did was created eight hypothetical products, everything from finance to editorial, and we didn't just create this idea of a product. We created a brand style guide and a logo. And these really helped us drive our design decisions. So we knew why we were making certain decisions in our UI. And when we first started material theming, the idea, we started with really broad explorations. This was probably the most fun I've ever had playing around with UI. Um, we explored the ways that we could really push material design to its limits. We looked at big, bold typography. We explored this idea of tonal color palettes and applying them to whole surfaces of the UI. We even looked at some of that surface metaphor that Yasmin mentioned in the beginning of the talk. And here you can see we're sort of changing the different z-index of these surfaces. But we had to reel things in a little bit and look at these three core areas in order to make sure that what we were delivering would be consumable and able to be used by everyone. So we had to look at our material principles. Were we still staying true to our core ideas of material design? We had to think about content and context. And that was sort of thinking about these brands and how people use these in context of their product needs. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, we needed to think about the user needs, not just the, what the product needs, but what your user needs when they're engaging with that product. So this is one of our case studies. This is Fortnightly, and this is our editorial product. And we didn't just create hero screens for these hypothetical products. What we did was create whole flows, and we 
even explored information architecture across all of these hypothetical brands. This way, we knew all of our components were aligning to all of their navigation needs. So something that makes sense for editorial, like a navigation drawer, might not make sense for another product or another IA. Here we have Rally, which is our finance app. And you can see how the UI changes to adapt for this content. So here, when the user is trying to engage with numbers and lots of content, we have more of a dense UI using a dashboard and more condensed lists. Um, thinking about the user was super important to us when we were thinking about material theming. So when we created these brands, like Basil, our recipe app, we thought about how is the user engaging with this content. And we thought, well, the, the Basil users are just looking for lean back browse content. So the component that we felt was the most appropriate was the image list. It's super image forward. The users can just scroll through and take in content in a really visual form. But then when we thought about some of our other apps, this is our hospitality app, when the user's intention was really to drive deep down and find the best price for a flight, we used a more utility-based component, like a list or a card, where the user can scan the prices. And we did this all while exploring visual ideas. So we looked at shape and color and typography and iconography through all of these brands. <clears throat> And we didn't just do this for our hypothetical products. We did this for Google. And this is our Google material theme that uses our proprietary typeface, Google Sans, our Google color palette, and our Google icons. And we had all these expressions, but we needed to create a way to enable anyone to create their own styles while still maintaining that consistency that material design provided. So we needed a starting point, a way to make expression accessible. We updated the baseline components based on the original system and included new components and expanded state information. And we also needed code. We hear you. We wanted a place to start where designers and developers could be on the same page for enabling theming capabilities. So we released material components, which are open source code available on web, iOS, Android, and Flutter. And we identified three ways to systematically express style, typography, shape, and color. <clears throat> so in, we've identified these three areas, but we have this component set. And we needed to find ways to inject these styles into our components. So we took a look at our simplest component we have here, our button. It's made up of a text string. We can change that text string. We can change that typography and allow it to express your brand. The button component also has a container. When you start with the baseline components, like Yasmin mentioned earlier, you're starting with this four dip corner radii. But we want to allow third parties to be more expressive with their button so they can change the shape. And then the button. Also, so this button text and this button container can also change its color. And you can have this reflect whatever brand color you'd like. So the button is a pretty simple example of one of our components. But we have lots of components, lots of more complex components. And we did this exercise pretty exhaustively. And it was really important not only to get all of the designers on the same page around what the different elements of the components were and how we could change those parameters in order to express theming. It was also super important that we shared this document across all of our disciplines so that designers, engineers, PMs were all on the same page around what we were designing. We needed a system for both designers and developers to express and control brand at a global level. So we created a simple architecture. <clears throat> so we had this idea of injecting styles, but we wanted a way to really simply explain it. So we created these three levels. The first level is a set of categories. Those categories each have a set of attributes, and those attributes have values. And this was our abstraction that we've created for material theming, something that we knew would be abstract enough for designers to understand and abstract enough to be applied to all of the different platform thinking. <clears throat> but let's look at this a little less abstractly through our type system. 
So the material design type system is made up of a type scale. The type scale are all of these different categories that you can use to create hierarchy with your type in your UI. So everything from headline one to headline six and caption. And all of these categories map to the same set of attributes and material theming. And these were intentional design decisions that we've chosen as ways to be expressive with typography. So we wanted to allow you to be able to change the font family, size, weight, letter spacing, and text transform in order to be expressive with type. So if we look at just one category, let's say button, you'll see that it starts with a set of values. These are the baseline values. You'll get these values with the baseline components in material design. And here's our button again. So we can see here we have Roboto medium, 14 point. This is what you're going to start with. But you can change those values for your button category. And what we're changing here to railway medium 14, pretty similar to Roboto, it has a good feel. And when I change that button category, it not only changes in the one instance, it's also going to change across all of the categories that map to button in our component set. This ensures that your typography is really consistent across all of your components. So we knew with this new material theming capabilities, we would need to expand our guidelines in order to give more granular details around how to theme. So what we did was added some more type guidance. We have here uh, one example that we found was a good place to be more expressive in UI is with larger headlines. So here's a place where you can use funkier, more displayed type typefaces, and it still retains that legibility and readability because they are at larger sizes. We do have some don'ts in our guidelines. Don't use these really expressive typefaces as really small sizes because your readers won't be able to read any of your UI. We have some more granular details like cautions in our spec, and this one I think is important to call out. So, I mentioned earlier that you're able to change the case in your um, categories of your type scale, which is either sentence, upper, lower, or um, all caps. And button typically is an all caps category. And we do this intentionally in order to really drive the user that this is an interactive element that they can touch, and something's going to happen when they do that. So if you are to change that text case to upper, lower, or sentence, make sure that you also provide other visual cues like here, we're providing color to indicate that it's still an interactive element in your UI. And we also wanted to provide some resources so you could start theming right away. And with Google Fonts, it is the largest open source repository of typefaces on the internet that you can easily embed into your web and Android products. And with that, let's look at building our own material theme. And let's take a step at looking at through typography. Cool. So we found a font that we liked. Great. Uh, Google off fonts. Google Fonts. Off Google Fonts, available. Tell us more about this font face. Great. This is Railway, which I mentioned earlier. It's pretty similar to Roboto. It has a good utility feel, but it's a little bit more playful, has some of those rounded curves that Roboto doesn't quite have. It also is a little bit wider. So it was actually originally drawn as a display face used for larger sizes, but then was expanded to smaller sizes and have more weights. So this is a pretty good uh, typeface to use in your UI. All right, but I actually want to see this in action. We keep on talking about code and that we've made it available, <laughs> but I haven't seen anything yet. So lucky for all of you, we have starting today um, two new projects, interactive projects on the web as well as on Android. And I'm going to give you a demo on how to use that. If you go to material.io on tools that build a material theme, do it afterwards, after the talk, after you watch it. You can go ahead and start theming and customizing it through all of our components so you can visualize your theme. And the two interactive projects on the web is built on Glitch, which allows us to easily see all of our changes that we made, and then on Android Studio, which is something that a lot of Android developers are already familiar with. So let's actually take a look. So if we were to implement this typography in the web, you would change your mytheme.sass file, and you would import this the railway typeface, as well as changing the font family across all of your components. All 
Are we going to go for the demo? I think we're going to go for the, for the demo here now. It's uh, one second. Oh. Maybe go back to the slide for a second. <laughs> Where is it? Oh, come on. OK. All right, great. Let's go back to the demo. So we have that this build a material theme project that's available on Glitch, and you can easily remix it. So it's essentially forking it and creating a copy that you can use and change. Lucky for us, I already went through uh, that process, and we have it all set up. So as you can see, on your right-hand side, you have the baseline values. And all of the components, they're built with code. So you can actually go in here and interact with them. It's the real-life code, so what the changes you make are actually going to be what you see in your product. So let's implement uh, our new type base. So we're just going to comment here the railway and add it as our font family. And you can instantly see that now Railway has been applied throughout all of our components. Now let's go back to the slide. So we can also do this on Android very easily. And that's by setting your font family and then changing your text appearance. So if we go back to the demo, you can quickly see that we've already checked our, changed our text appearance and added Railway for our font family. And we can see that we have this uh, new, you know, all of our components visible here. So let's run it again to see our changes take place. And now you can instantly see that Railway has been applied to all of the components. And again, all of these are interactive. So you can play with them and know what your app is going to feel like. Let's go back to the slides. So this is also available on Flutter. And this is how you would implement using Dart. And since we also have uh, material components available on iOS, this is how you would apply your new uh, type uh, scale on iOS. Great. So now <clears throat> I'm going to take you through that same system of categories, attributes, and values, and how we applied that to the material design shape system. So our shape system is pretty simple. It's made up of what we call our shape scheme. And it's made up of these three categories, small components, medium components, and large components. And similarly to typography, all of these categories in the shape system will map to the same set of attributes. And here in the shape system, we allow you to tweak both the shape size and the shape family. So here we have our button again. Our typography is already applied. That's railway there. And we can see the button maps to the category small in our shape scheme. And the values, what you're going to start with, are those baseline values. So when you start with material baseline, you're going to be starting with the shape size of 4, and you'll have that nice rounded corner. But this brand and this theme is a little bit more playful and wants to be a little bit more rounded. So here we change the values of the category of small component to be round and 20 dip. And again, when you change that one category, it's not that you have to go into all of your other components and change those specific shapes. That change will get applied to all of the categories that inherit that small category. <clears throat> We also provided some shape system guidance, since this is sort of a new theming capability for material. But a lot of the principles were sort of still existing in the core of material design. So strong differences in shape we find really drive the user's eye. And <clears throat> this was the original intent of the floating action button. So this is a circular button that lives in a world of rectangles. When you look through a UI, there's lots of squares and app bars and cards and images. But then you see the fab. And it's this big circle in the bottom corner. And it really draws the user's eye. And they know that it's an interactive element. We also explored this idea of asymmetric shapes. <clears throat> These can be used to draw emphasis. They should be used pretty subtly in the UI. But when you do use them, 
make sure you're using them intentionally. Here, this app is using uh, <clears throat> a shape in the top corner to draw the user's eye to the navigation drawer. We also found that shape can be used to communicate state. So this theme is using a shaped corner of their card to indicate that the user has gesturally swiped and favorited this item. And it not only gives a visual cue of the iconography and the color, we're also giving that small affordance of the rounded shape in order to really drive that state to the user. We do have some don'ts for shape. This is one of them. Don't be too literal with your shapes in your UI. This will, not, this will be confusing for your users. They won't understand that this is supposed to be a button. They'll think, I'm not sure what they'll think it is, but. But what about if my brand is like a truck? <laughs> Don't do it? Don't do it, yes, me. And we also provided some tools to help you uh, start with developing your shapes game. And we have an inline uh, customization tool available on material.io that allows you to customize your radius as well as your uh, family, so if that's uh, cut corners or rounded. And you can see how it gets applied to the small, medium, and large components. So you can really go in there and uh, change your shapes game. All right, so let's go actually and build this uh, material theme using shape. Let's go to the demo. All right. In the new interactive project, we can see that all of our theme, we have a theme summary view, and that tells us what our shape system is, as well as our typographic scale and color. And we have some handy links that, that link out to the tools that we just talked about. So let's develop our shapes game, Michelle. I'm thinking for small, what do you, what do you have in mind? I think we were thinking about 20 dip. 20, OK. It's a lot, it's, uh, but I kind of like it. It's very kind of friendly, round, approachable. Now let's see what that looks like. OK, that's how it's going to look like applied to our components. Um, let's look at our medium components. What do you think? Mm, maybe more like 16. 16, OK. No, 24, maybe? Mm. 16, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to 16. And we see how that gets applied to the medium components. And last but not least, let's check out the large components, which is going to be more of the like navigation drawer um, that gets applied on bottom or side. So what are we thinking here? Maybe yeah. bump it back up to 20. Yeah, no, 36, 0, 20, OK. All right, oh, look at that, 20, perfect. So are we comfortable with the shape scheme? You think you, you like it? We're good? Yeah, looking good. So we got 20 for small, 16 for medium, and 20 for large. All right, let's go apply it to our, our interactive project here and see how it looks. Oh, look at that. We have the code already written. <laughs> but let's look, at the, let's look at the slide to um, go back and look at our shapes game. So as you can see, we chose our 20 uh, dip for small and our medium co components uh, 16 dip, and our large 20 dip, which really makes it a bit more friendly and approachable. And if we would apply this on the web, we would go into our SAS variables, and you can easily see that they're grouped by small, medium, large uh, components that you can easily change. So let's go back to the demo. Since we have all that code written, Let's just uh, uncomment it here. And just like magic, boom. Our shape scheme has been applied to all of our components. So you can see that it's already changed the radius for the button. Let's go back to our slides. So if we're going to apply our shape uh, scheme on Android, you would go into a shape.xml file. And here, you set the shape appearance uh, for your small, medium, and large components as well, as well as choosing your corner family. In this case, it's rounded, so we're going to choose rounded. And then we choose our corner size. And we'll, let's stay on that slide for a second. All right, let's go back to the demo. So in the demo, you can see that the code is available here. Again, 
selecting our corner family and corner size. And let's hit run to actually see these changes take place. All right, and now we see that shape has gone through all of our components. And I'm feeling pretty good with this theme. I like it. All right, let's go back to the slides. And Flutter is going to introduce uh, shape theming. It's going to be coming soon. But this is how you would do this on Flutter and Dart. And we also have this capability on iOS through our material components. And this is how you would apply your shape scheme on iOS. Cool. So lastly, we're going to talk through our color system. And again, our color system is structured in these same ways, with the system of categories, attributes, and values. So our color system is made up of a color scheme. These are the colors that get applied across all of your components in the UI, everything from primary, secondary, to surfaces and backgrounds. The attributes of these categories are container hex and content hex. This is to ensure accessibility and contrast ratios are meeting the accessibility standards. So here's our button again. We have our theme typography. We have our theme shape. But we're still with our baseline colors. So this is, again, the material design baseline. You'll start with this purple. But you can go in and change these colors. So button maps to our category's primary. And here we're going to change the color to more of a deep, richer purple but keep that typography white and ensure that accessibility contrast ratio. So when you change your primary in one place at the global level, that gets applied across all of your components. And we also added some new color system guidance to our material design spec. So I mentioned primary and secondary colors. We find that these are the best ways to inject bright, bold, branded colors into your UI. This app here is using a branded color bottom uh, app bar, and it's using a secondary color as this pop of yellow to contrast against that blue. One of the main principles of color in material design is to ensure that you're allocating semantic meaning to your color. So in this theme, the primary and secondary color are this nice deep purple, and the secondary color is this pop of red that works nicely together. But we also have a category in our, sh in our color scheme that is allocated for error. And typically, an error state will be a red color. This is sort of that visual cue to your user that something has gone wrong, and that red really reinforces that. But in this app's use case, the red is part of their brand story, and they don't want to conflate the idea of error and red. So what they did was chose an alternate, a nice orange color, to indicate an error state in the UI. Um, one of the last principles of color that we really want to drive through with material design is ensuring accessibility and contrast ratios. And we also provided some tools to help you pick your color palette. Uh, we have a material color palette generator that allows you to pick a primary color. And if you don't have a secondary color, it provides some options for you to choose from. Uh, but it also creates this tonal palette that you can use throughout your UI. So let's build a material theme using color. Sorry, let's go back to the slide. Lucky for us, we already have a brand that we're going to be working with. Yeah. So this brand, you can see that its logo type is made up of this deep purple background that's most of the color in this logo. And then it has this nice pop of red that's on the top of the crane. So we're going to use those colors that exist in this brand to apply to the color scheme. So the primary color will be this purple, and the secondary color will be this red. And again, the error color is going to be something contrasting, so it's not conflicting with the brand expression. And this is how you would apply those color changes on the web, using material components for web. So you have your theme primary, theme secondary, as well as your theme error. 
Now let's look at the demo. So we've already added a lot of these values that we can quickly just common out, and we're going to instantly see the changes take place. Ooh, it's starting to look pretty good, Michelle. I feel like, I feel like it's kind of missing something, though. What Maybe a think? background color? Maybe a background color. Let's look at our wonderful theme summary, and it links out to our wonderful palette, our material palette generator tool. Lucky for us, we already have a you know, primary that we can just copy from here and insert into the tool, which provides a wonderful tonal palette. But we also have the secondary, so let's just add that there. Great. Now we can see that this is our tonal palette that we created. Um, what about if we changed it to a lighter color, a yeah. lighter shade? What do you think? I think that's great. The tonal 50 value is the lowest in the material design tonal palette, and it's great to be used for bigger splashes of color like backgrounds. All right, let's try it out. Ooh. <laughs> So you can see just by changing some color, it really changes the whole interface. And all of this is easily done with just some few lines of code on the web. Oh, this is looking nice. I kind of want to use this now in my product. Yeah? All right, let's go back to the slide. And you would do the same process uh, on Android through your color.xml file. You would set your color primary, color secondary, your color error, and your color background. So let's go to the demo to look at this in action. Again, we've already set our values already, so we can quickly just auto run it again and see all of that changes take place. Just like Magic, you have a consistent theme that's available on Android web. Look at that. That's nice. <laughs> and all of these projects provide a theme summary view, so you can quickly look at it and look at all of your colors, as well as your shape system and your typographic scale, both on Android and on the web. This makes it really easy to, at a glance, look at your theme and say, hey, I think we want to maybe change some things. And you can do it in code. And you know that whatever you as a designer see, the developer is going to implement as well, because you're working off the same code base. Let's go to the slides. So again, you can implement this on Flutter by changing the color scheme and changing all of your values for primary and secondary, surface, background, et cetera, as well as iOS. And both of these projects that we demo today on the web using Glitch and uh, within Android Studio are all available on material.io slash tools slash build a material theme. Just go to material.io. You'll find a link in there. Um, but all of this is available for you to start theming and playing with. And we're really excited to see what you all do with it. We'll wait some time for you to, to get that URL picture. Uh, but we've wanted to really enable developers and designers to have a great starting point. And through this project, what you see and the changes that you make are actually represented in code. So that is actually what you're going to be seeing in your products. And we really can't see all the wonderful material themes that you'll be building with today. So please, again, go to material.io, check out the projects that are available on Android Studio, as well as the web using Glitch. And you can really see your themes come to life. And we can't wait to see what you, what you build. Thank you. We're also demoing the uh, build a material theme in our 
sandbox. Yes, in our sandbox, which is right there, sandbox E, we're going to be demoing the build a material theme. And you can actually print it out, which is pretty fun. Um, and we're also going to be asking, uh, sorry, not asking questions. You're going to be asking questions, and we're going to be answering them. So we're going to have Q&A in Sandbox E in the uh, Box Talk Q&A area. And thank you all so much for coming. You can go to material.io to find the latest, as well as following at Material Design to get the latest updates from us. And again, don't forget to try out those tools and share with us. We'd love to see what you come up with. Again, thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you.